Ladies and gentlemen, it's 7.30. We are about to start our first student danger forum of the year, of the year 2012. Uh, my name is Magnus Thorkert Bertnason. I'm professor of history and the Gaudino scholar. We have a very dangerous event starting at 9 p.m., the presidential debate. So we want to make sure that we finish this discussion before that time. So we want to get started. Before I introduce the speakers and the subject matter, I just want to say a few things at the outset. As you know, uh, most of you are here because you're enrolled in one of the five dangerous courses uh, of this semester. There are about 180 students this semester in enrolled in these dangerous courses. That means about 10% of the student body in residence is enrolled in a dangerous course in one way or another. And we are trying to link these courses together and have a public discussion in, uh, in this way because I think the college doesn't do enough about having public discussions about what takes place in the classroom. It's really bizarre when you read the Williams record that the predominant stuff in the Williams record is about sports or theater or performances or, or extracurricular activities, but hardly ever do we discuss publicly the discovery, the debate, the discussion that happens in our classroom. This is a place of teaching and learning. And we hardly ever talk about teaching and learning. And so I thought we thought we should have one of these forums to hear what we're doing in each other's classrooms so that you can learn from each other, that we can make connections, and maybe a class that you would have wanted to take but couldn't for whatever reason. You could maybe hear what they're doing in that particular class. So that's number one. In general, let's talk more about what we do in our classrooms and try to make connections and learn from each other. Second of all, we also, because we are connected by this theme of danger, that it might be helpful in our own investigations of danger or materials or whatever you're doing, whatever inquiry you're doing, to hear about how other people might be approaching the subject matter. And so that might be an interesting, fun way to, to investigate the matter. So we have... Uh, nine panelists representing five courses. They were given a task, several questions which they were uh, sort of charged to consider. And first of all, they're supposed to describe the overall subject matter of the course and some of the assumptions of their course. And then they're supposed to consider how danger is reflected in the material and to what extent the methodology or the theoretical academic framework limit or enhance those questions. So that's sort of about the course material. And then finally, they'll end on a personal note. They'll talk about how their views of danger may be same or different than from their parents or their grandparents' generation. And we have, we're going to start with uh, the, st uh, the student from uh, Professor Garbarini's course called Memory, History and Extermination of Jews of Europe. That's Liz Hecht, Dangerous History. Then that will be followed by Professor Banta's course, Dangerous Exposures, Environment, Immunity, Infectious Disease, and that's Alison Smith and Ad Adrian Strait. Then that will be followed by Jim Shepard's course, uh, Catastrophe, Apocalypse, the Movie, and that is Nick Browning and Alison Roche. Fourth, we'll have Jerry Caprio's course on financial crisis, causes, and cures, and that's uh, Zach Tarlow and, and uh, Amanda Ning. And finally, we'll have Professor Bragg's course, Comic Lives, Graphic Novels, and Dangerous Histories of the African Diaspora. So the format will be that they will speak in, uh, in that order, about five to seven minutes per course. So that will give us, give us to about 8 p.m. and then we'll have about half an hour, uh, 40 minutes of discussion if they want to ask each other or for you to, to bring in what you are, feel what would like to add to the discussion. So, Liz Hecht, class of 2013, here you, you start. Can everyone hear me? Is that, okay. Hi, I'm Liz. Um, I'm a senior history and literary studies double major. And as Professor Bernhardson said, I'm here to represent Pr Professor Garbarini's history tutorial on memory, history, and the extermination of the Jews in Europe. So far, the tutorial has focused on a series of questions and debates. How was the Holocaust understood, assimilated, and represented in the decades immediately following Allied liberation of Nazi Germany? Can we consider the Holocaust to be an unprecedented or even a unique event? What are the implications of doing so? How does this affect our understanding of other genocides around the world and throughout time? How does it serve to make the Holocaust so phenomenological that it is no longer connected to human beings? At the same time, however, what is the danger of attributing the Holocaust to larger processes and trends, and again, not to humans? What are the stakes in arguing that the Holocaust is non-comparable for German nationhood and identity? What happens to our sense of good and evil, of right and wrong, when we begin to think about German citizens not only as perpetrators responsible for supporting a racist, murderous regime, but also as victims of an allied air raid on German cities? We have looked specifically at the tasks facing historians. These are tasks, um, you know, how should historians uh, treat, should historians treat the Holocaust just as any other period in history, or does it deserve 
special or unconventional treatment? How should historians deal with periodization? Do you start a story of the Holocaust with the rise of National Socialism, with the emergence of the German Confederation, with the beginning of the Jewish diaspora? We've also examined dilemmas facing lawmakers. Can a tribunal serve didactic purposes, or must it serve solely legal ends? Is our justice system even equipped to deal with modern atrocity of this scale? Who should stand trial? What happens when the courtroom becomes a classroom of sorts, or a theater in which victims, perpetrators, and bystanders can tell their stories? How should the law make sense of these categorizations in light of what Primo Levi referred to as the gray zone? During this semester, we will continue to examine the dilemmas facing not only historians and members of the judi judiciary, but also filmmakers, novelists, museum curators, architects, educators, government officials, and individuals grappling with this history. In all of the capacities I've described, people continue to use, shape, and mobilize memory of the Holocaust. All of this constitutes, to borrow a term from the historian Margaret Macmillan, a dangerous game. And now turning to how danger is reflected in the course. Um, this course explores the extent to which the ways we not only write about but also remember the past can have huge implications for the present and future. It touches on the potential uses and abuses of historical argumentation for thinking about identity. It examines the implications of this history for thinking about humanity, unsettling cozy assumptions about human nature. And it addresses the potential for Norman hu humans to act for bad and for good. Memory of the extermination of the Jews in Europe has begun to affect many networks and groups. It is an international and transnational story that has been mobilized for a variety of purposes. It has made me realize that remembering is not enough. Addressing how we remember is equally, if not more, important. It is in our examination of how people have and continue to remember the Holocaust that this class has touched on danger and risk. How we remember matters. It matters in terms of how we shape policies and how we justify actions, some of which may cause physical, emotional, or psychological distress for others. Moreover, if we fail to remember, or remember in such a way that allows us to undo the Holocaust in our own minds, we may find ourselves in danger of repeating what must be avoided. Indeed, perpetrators of administrative mass murder and genocides around the world have either failed to remember at all, or have manipulated memory in a manner that supports their actions. This history has unusually tangible implications for people writing in different presents. By examining the implications in those implications in presence beyond our own, and then turning to the implications and dilemmas related to memory work being done in this present, we as a class are addressing how dangerous memory can really be. Not in the sense that remembering involves immediate physical danger, but in the sense that the way we, remem we remember horrific pasts, pasts can have implications, good and bad, in the present and future. I think of danger as being related to risk. As Andreas Husen has explained in his book, Present Pasts, se quote, securing the past is no less risky an enterprise than securing the future, end quote. A number of works we have read have addressed the issue of risk. The risk involved in submitting traumatic hi history to criminal law, for the defendant may prevail. The risk, the risk in arguing for or against the Holocaust's uniqueness. And the risk involved in proposing that German literature should not only describe guilt and culpability, but should also address German suffering. So this history both involves taking risk and impacts, and impacts on the present and future in potentially frightening ways. In terms of methodology, the way we've gone about this is entering these debates by reading the works that people who have been prominent figures in these debates have written, reading secondary literature, um, historians commenting on those debates, and then in engaging in those debates to some degree ourselves. It's a tutorial, so one of us will write an essay um, about you know, some of the issues that it raises, challenging, taking a side, and then the partner will write a response. And in the tutorial, we'll either you know, try to make sense of what's going on in these debates, some of the concepts, or we'll actually sit there and debate them. Um, so it's a way of sort of inserting ourselves into this, this dangerous and, and, and risky memory work and, and forcing ourselves to actually stand up and present a paper that takes a side. And I think at least my partner and I have both sort of said things and that have been kind of risky and either pulled back a little bit or you know fought behind them and that's been a really valuable exercise because I think in thinking about danger and risk in my own life, 
I don't feel that I face danger very often. I'm living in Williamstown, I leave my room unlocked, I walk around alone at night, and that could have to do with my age, but I think, and you know, where I am, and I'm at this college, but I think that it's really easy for us to look at these theories and say that this memory work is really dangerous, and a really different thing to kind of insert yourself in it, and something that we aren't totally able to do yet, um, but that, you know, maybe not for us as students, but for the people doing this work, um, is something very risky. In terms of my parents and grandparents and generational stuff, um, I think it's, it's so individual and varies from person to person, but one of the things that I see as different between the way I think of danger and the way my parents do is that I actually think that their generation might have been one more willing to take risks, especially, and this is my parents and my, maybe not everyone else, but especially when it came to sort of fighting for social justice. And I mean, this was the era, you know, they came of age during the Vietnam War and would skip class to go to protests and that was a common thing that everyone did. And I'll never forget my dad's frustration with me when I didn't listen to him when he told me I shouldn't walk at my high school graduation in protest of some school policy or I didn't skip class to attend a, a protest in LA. Um, and so it almost makes me think that our generation is somehow less willing to take risks, but I think in other ways that that's them. And I, I think we also, my dad, I talked to my dad about this and we think about danger differently. He thinks of it in a much more left brain analytical kind of way, whereas me, it's, for me it's more of a visceral thing. And in terms of this history, one of the things that we've addressed is actually how the way that people have remembered the Holocaust has changed over time. Um, and when my parents were growing up, this was something that wasn't even talked about. And it was only sort of um, when they were, you know, in, in the six, 60s or 70s when, when people started doing this work. And that for them in terms of the dangers involved in, in doing this history has been, you know, they, they've seen it become something that can be talked about, but a lot of these debates emerged um, later in their lifetimes. And I think for us entering, entering this history where survivors and people who live through this are our grandparents and they are, you know, people who are dis distant from us in terms of, of age and years, um, I think that it's different. The way we relate to it is different, and it's almost even more important to look at those debates and, and acknowledge sort of how the way we remember this past has changed, and also the risks that have been taken and the risks that are involved in the way that we continue to remember this history. All right. Um. So our course focuses on infectious diseases and immunity. Um, so the way I think about it, we look at a molecular level up to and scale up to a larger level. So we look at infectious diseases on a level as small as how does one change in one nucleotide affect one amino acid, affect one domain of one protein, which changes the function of something in a virus, which kind of snowball effect from there. And so we look at, we read papers that are at that level of molecular, and then we read papers that are more of an ecological level, um, asking how does this disease affect this species affect this area. Um, and then we also look at the human response to infectious disease, so that would be immunity on a molecular level as well as a more broader social level and kind of looking at questions that um, our society has to deal with around infectious disease, like should we pursue this study um, if it has risks as well as, you know, it could be helpful and it could have risks. And kind of we've also looked at um, the danger underlying um, infectious diseases, so like the relationships between inequality and infectious diseases. And so that's kind of our subject matter. Um, then, yeah, okay, so the way that we structure our course, it being a tutorial, um, we're reading more scientific papers, and then I think one assumption underlying in the course is that you're reading this scientific paper, and then you, it's a different type of reading than a reading for a history class where you're looking at the diagrams and piecing together kind of your own story out of that paper and then processing that to get your, to make your own claims. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about how dangers reflect in our material and I think it really helps to look at some of the prompts we've been given. Um, so usually each prompt has focused on a different disease or cancer. So. Um, we had one prompt focusing on Ebola, for example, and this was a really cool prompt where we had to actually come up with a grant proposal um, in which we argued either like a conservation biology issue or um, in terms of vaccine development and actually suggested a grant that we would, some research we'd want to do um, to further our understanding of Ebola. So that's once again like taking a claim on Ebola and what need, how the research needs to be furthered. Um, another example is we have done a prompt on transmissible cancer and um, how that fit into the virulence trade-off model. Um, 
and more recently we actually had a prompt on H5N1 and it was about um, engineering. Actually this, the paper itself was um, a study about how they had engineered a strain in ferrets that was um, they were predicting would be transmissible between humans and this was a really controversial pa paper because people were saying this is you know useful information for bioterrorists. They could take they actually gave the specific amino acid switches needed um, that they tested to make this tr cancer transmissible um, or H5N1 vi virus transmissible and um, we're publishing it and people are saying this is really really useful for bioterrorists. Um, you know, we've talked about um, HPV and whether that's dangerous. Um, we've talked about what you know what vaccines should be developed for different um, for different viruses. So those are some examples. Okay, um, and then I think that there's the danger in the course material itself, and then there's the danger inherent in the format, which is it's a tutorial. And I think that um, there's kind of a vulnerability to a tutorial a little bit because you send off your paper and then you know that your partner has 24 hours to kind of poke holes in it and to find flaws in your paper, which is a really cool process um, because there's kind of a trust there too there as well. You know, I trust that you're going to critique it, but that's okay. And um, I think it really strengthens for our course because a lot of times in a, the typical science class, um, you can kind of end up in a lecture hall feeling like you're just trying to fill your brain with facts and information and memorizing things. Um, and this is a very different approach to science, I think, because we're reading these papers and we're sort of fig putting the pieces together in a puzzle and trying to figure out. Um, and there's kind of a, you get a personal stake a little bit when you write a paper because you're asked to make a claim about something like, well, does this disease fit this model? Should this study have been published? And you have to put a little bit of your own, kind of your own self, your own thought into that. Um, and I think, so there's a huge strength in that, having the tutorial format for the danger type of course. And there's also a slight limitation there, I think, too, which is that since you're in one partnership, you don't have quite as many views present, and you don't have, you would maybe focus in on one, um, one aspect of one paper when we've read three different papers. And so you don't get as much of a broad range, as many different views as you might have if you were in a larger um, seminar class where people are kind of sharing all over the place. But I think there's a huge strength there as well. Yeah, I think that my concept of danger has definitely changed over the course of just this t tutorial so far. I feel like I've really realized how um, quickly a virus or cancer can become evolve and just become so much more lethal. Um, like in the example of the H5N1 flu, like literally it was four um, nucleotide or four amino acid switches, and it becomes like transmissible between humans, and that's like you know that's very scary for me. Um, and I feel like the other thing has been realizing how I think this is something diverse from my parents is realizing how like something that's the easy access to this material, how all these scientific papers are being published with all of this, these new research techniques and how easy it is for those papers to be accessed, kind of going back to the bioterrorism idea, like that's scary for me. Um, and I think there's been a slight shift over time in what our society tends to be worried about. Like, I mean, I wasn't alive through the Cold War, um, anything like that, but I think that I see sort of a shift in more worries towards like infectious diseases and the idea of the bioterrorism as well as just the evolution of a new strain that could wipe people out. Um, and I think the increased travel around the world, the speed of the transmission um, of people and ideas and things around the world kind of makes that worry more. But for me, I think that the way that this course has made me think about danger is the amount of things that we don't know. I think for every time that I read something and I'm like, this is so cool, I learned a new thing, it just opens up so many more things that we don't know that we're, you know, hopefully research will get funding for, that more grant proposals will actually go through. and. But I think that every time you learn one thing, it's like it shines a light on so many things that you don't know. And for example, we read one paper about H5N1, which was trying to assess the probability that the mutations necessary for it to go from not scary to really scary. Um, and they kind of couldn't come up with an answer. They couldn't say, you know, we tried, we plugged the numbers in, but there are so many unknowns, we can't really come up with a number for the chance that this is going to happen. And I think that, to me, is what I consider dangerous. Not the fact that even there are dangerous things, but we don't know how dangerous they are sometimes. So. All right, so Nick and I are in English 140, which is um, called Catastrophe Apocalypse, the movie. And we've watched a variety of films. Um, we meet every Sunday evening, and we'll watch a movie. And then on Tuesday and Thursday in class, we'll discuss the film. And we've watched a variety of genres of films, um, 
from dramas like Schindler's List to zombie movies like 28 Days Later. And the whole point of the course is to um, push us to our limits of what we think catastrophe and danger and apocalypse consist of. Um, on the first day of class, Professor Shepard had us go up to the board and write down uh, what we were most afraid of. And the answers on the board differed from like, giant spiders to nuclear holocaust to everyone in your family being dead. And it's really um, pushed us to the limit of what uh, the possibilities of danger are. Uh, in terms of danger in the subject matter, uh, all the movies we're watching in some way deal with uh, a major catastrophe or an apocalypse. So we've seen you know, Schindler's List, which depicts the Holocaust. We've seen Dr. Strangelove, which is uh, during the Cold War era when uh, you know, the US and Russia are toe to toe. And um, in many ways, our discussions in class really reflect the material we've seen. Um, so we're, we're seeing these movies, and, and you're seeing the, the, the director's depiction of what this era was like. Um, and it, it brings up danger in an academic context because uh, none of us have, have other ways of uh, seeing or remembering these um, eras in history. Like we were born afterwards. And so it's a way of uh, accessing these dangerous time periods um, in a very graphic manner, in a very visual manner, which is uh, different than reading about it. Um, that's very helpful. In terms of uh, danger uh, as the context, in the context of the course and the setup, it's a seminar course and uh, every day in class we're asked to promote our own views. And you have to be very, uh, you, you present your views and you own them, but you have to be able to support them. And that can often be difficult, especially with the class uh, challenging your ideas, with the teacher proposing new ideas. And you have to be able to stand behind your idea. And it's, um, you know, there have been instances, I think I speak for the class, when we've presented an idea and it's been shot down by the rest of the class. And so that's a, that's a risk you're taking. Um, and you know it's a risk you're taking, but it's still, uh, you have to be ready to support your ideas and own them and present them in a manner that uh, people, that, you, that if people challenge them, you'll be able to back it up. So. That's danger in terms of the class setup. Yeah, and it really um, has been pushing us to our limits in terms of um, empathy and what we might expect from ourselves in dangerous and apocalyptic situations. I know there's, um, there's a lot of times where we're empathizing with the characters and there's a lot of times where we disagree with the actions they might take in the face of adversity. So in a lot of situations we're set up um, to feel what the character is feeling in these times of great strife. Um, a lot of the times there's this general theme of humanity versus inhumanity, and we're forced to confront this on a multitude of levels. Um, in certain cases it might be zombies, and in other cases it's Nazis. And so through this course, we're being exposed to danger on um, many different levels. Uh, in terms of how our personal danger uh, is different than maybe danger that our grandparents or parents experienced. Uh, I'm speaking personally now, but I know when I watch some of these movies, uh, they feel like movies. If anyone's seen Dr. Strangelove, it's a, it's a satire set during the Cold War. And so you're watching it and you're laughing at parts and you're experiencing it. And then the movie ends and you're, you're walking back to your dorm or whatever and you realize that that's the time era that your grandparents lived through. Like that wasn't a, that wasn't a joke. It was very close to a nuclear holocaust. And, and so um, it's, it puts in context some of these dangerous times, these dangerous areas in history that were very real for our parents and our grandparents that, that we can access through film. And film is not always 100% accurate, but what it does give you is a very visual depiction of what these time periods are like. So Schindler's List is Spielberg's, Spielberg's presentation of the Holocaust. And in many ways, it's not 100% factually correct, but it uh, invokes emotions in, in ways that I think uh, written papers uh, and testimonials, which are 100% factual, don't. Um, it's much different to see the Holocaust the way Oscar Schindler sees the Holocaust and much different to read about a, a court case. Both are very valid, um, but they invoke different emotions in the person. Like Nick was saying, there's this, we're exposed to this sense of vulnerability where some of the characters, particularly in Schindler's List, um, there's this, um, when people are saved in Schindler's List, it's usually either through luck or resourcefulness. And you really see how vulnerable you are in settings which could be considered, which are obviously dangerous, such as apocalyptic events or catastrophes. And there's really um, this focus throughout the course on 
um, the contrast between luck and resourcefulness in dealing with dangerous situations. For as long as there has been financial intermediation, there has been financial crisis. Econ 392, financial crisis causes and cures. The, um, the goal of this course is to investigate such historical crises, isolate any reoccurring <coughs> themes, and discuss strategies that might reduce the frequency and severity of crisis. We began this course by examining the necessity of finance. Um, one of our big assumptions is that finance is inherently good and, in fact, necessary to facilitate economic growth. Finance mobilizes savings so that capital intensive sort of large scale, perhaps public projects can be completed. Uh, banks efficiently allocate capital from savers to borrowers so that a nation's resources, capital resources, are best put to their, um, their most sort of productive uses. As Alexander Hamilton once so more or less famously said, banks were the happiest engines that were ever invented for creating economic growth. Okay, so I'm gonna go over some of the assumptions that our course, um, sort of instills, us, instills in us as we go along. I, I know um, one of the assumptions that I came as a course with was that a lot of economic theory is based on um, the, the notion of the rational agent and that people, given, um, given certain conditions, would respond accordingly to changes in incentives. Uh, but one of the books we were reading, um, he, Kindleberger, the author, would basically he basically wrote a whole history of the financial crises since there has been a financial sector, basically. And he points out time after time how people have a tendency to be irrational. And the, he points out the potential for irrational agents collectively to cause disproportional harm to the financial system repeatedly. Um, another assumption that um, the course makes is that we can by looking at all these historical um, studies of past financial crises, we can learn from the past and somehow model the financial crises to, uh, such as identifying causes and effects, and that could somehow help us better manage future crises. So that's a key assumption. And um, there's also the assumption that they can somehow be prevented. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. do you have anything to add? No, I just have one of the, um, to add one of the goals of this course is that well, we hope that our studies will sort of find commonalities between various episodes of crisis and allow us to formulate policies that will prevent the more downtrodden uh, parts of economic history from repeating themselves. The, um, the causes for crisis are always easy to spot in hindsight. Um, we look to dissect the causes of crises and look to find commonal um, commonalities among different ones that might avail, um, enable us to sort of falling into the same, um, the same common traps. Um, in retrospect, um, looking at the most recent financial crisis, offering some prime loans to individuals with poor credit and really no foreseeable way to paying back their debt was a terrible idea. At the time, however, no one really recognized that they were in the midst of a housing bubble that was destined to pop. Although we can find um, trends between crises and generally recognize that periods of excessive optimism, a lack of regulatory oversight, and lax credit controls perhaps are the primary culprits of financial crisis, and perhaps each individual crisis might be so varied that there is little we can do to prevent them. The LDC crisis of the 1980s had nothing to do with the housing market, and I'm willing to bet that the next, up, that the next um, episode of crisis won't either. The hope behind our studies is that um, we might be able to prevent and sort of formulate policies that will help us um, reduce the severity and prevent financial crisis in the future. Um, as one of our classmates re remarked, this is a distant hope, or maybe assumption, that there is not something about human nature that can cause bubbles, since we've been studying them for as long as they've happened. And although the details always seem different, many of the underlying variables um, remain the same. Yeah, and um, to go more specifically into the dangers of this course, um, so for financial crises, one of the obvious dangers is the uh, negative consequences of the crises themselves. A lot of families get hurt. Financially, during the Great Depression, people, the economy was so bad that there was actually starvation. Um, job insecurity, I'm sure uh, as seniors we uh, experienced that well enough. Uh, people lose their savings, th their houses, there are lower standards of living. There are also impacts on both health and happiness. Um, but besides that, for in a more abstract way, there's danger of, um, there's a dangerous tendency to 
um, mistake the real danger of collapse for manageable risk. And um, I'm no, I don't know how many of you are familiar with, I guess, sort of the terminology that people use in the financial sector, but um, the word risk has come to mean something that can be assessed, quantified, managed, and minimized by rational agents. Um, it's something that, uh, that firms when they think of uh, the maximum loss they can make calculating the risk that they have in their investments, they normally use financial modeling to quantify all their factors. And just this very practice of you know, quantifying, knowing that they can qu quantify their risk can sometimes lead them to be overly confident in their investments, maybe make riskier um, decisions than they would normally do in the face of uncertainty. Um, there's also the danger of thinking that we and our times are exceptional because one of the <coughs> trends that we see repeatedly for each financial crisis is that um, even when there are warning signs, people tend to think that, oh, this might have happened before. You, we saw this before and it might have led to a financial crisis before, but our times are, it might be different this time or it's going to be different this time and people somehow um, continue on the road they were and continue making not the wisest decisions in um, investing. Yeah. Um, one of our classmates remarked that in the case of financial crisis, our parents and grandparents would probably consider them equally as dangerous as they are today, but it's sort of in a different way. Um, today, we are more concerned with the frequency of crisis, while our grandparents were most concerned with the severity and depth of a crisis. Um, I know in the, partic um, the particular instance of one of my grandfathers, he was uh, graduating college um, in a not so great economic time right before, um, right in the late 1930s, right as sort of the U.S. was still struggling to come out of the, um, the Great Depression. And while rather unfortunately World War II sort of altered his pre, his, I'm sorry, his post-college plans, um, financial crisis often has a way of affecting people's livelihoods, how they're going to sort of on a day-to-day -day basis, um, sort of have a household and a family and all the good things that I think a lot of us hope to have one day. And that's a, sort of a direct threat and a direct challenge to, um, to that, um, that sort of standard of living. So in that sense, um, I think um, my grandfather, at least, and I sort of sh same that, share that same view of the dangers inherent in, um, in financial crisis. All right, so I'm Dan and this is Christian. Uh, we're both sophomores in Comics Live, which is an Africana studies class. Uh, it focuses on ethnic traumas depicted in graphic novel form. Uh, each of the authors that, we that we've read uh, portrays the theme of danger in various ways. And so I'm gonna briefly go over the different ways in which uh, danger is portrayed. All right, so this is our first novel. Uh, it's Bayou, Volume 1, by Jeremy Love. And in this story, the protagonist, Lee, is a young black girl, and her friend, uh, Lily, is, like, stolen by this creature, uh, Cotton-Eyed Joe. So, uh, uh, Lily goes missing, and Lee's father is accused of kidnapping and killing Lily. <clears throat> so Lee goes on a search by herself to find Lily, and it shows a lot of the danger because she's a young girl who's in, in a racist community in the South who's forced to, to go by herself and find her, find her friend and save her dad. Um, then we also have King by Hoche Anderson. And this is kind of, a, this is a graphic novel of the retelling of Martin Luther King. And it's kind of like a different perspective on King's life, which is, which is dangerous in a way because, I mean, most people know like the general story behind Martin Luther King and he puts a little twist on it and, and uh, portrays some stereotypes that might be a little controversial. All right, so Love incorporates this danger of foreshadowing in, <clears throat> in the graphic novel. And here's a panel where Lee is going to, to search for her friend at this house. And you, know, you can see like the trees are, are spooky looking. It looks like a haunted house. There's a, crow, there's a black crow overhead. And it just like speaks danger because you can tell that inside that house there's nothing good there. All right, so there's also some very disturbing images that speak danger. Uh, here we have Lee who runs into the forest and she finds all of these lynched people hanging from trees. And Lee's like a very, you know, she's a young girl and like for, for a young girl to see this, that, that's pretty disturbing. All right, so the next type of danger is like 
uh, when people grow up too fast. So in this ethnic trauma, uh, Lee is growing up too fast. She's a young girl, and this is at the very beginning of the novel when she's forced to go into the bayou and pull out the body of a young boy named Billy Glass. Uh, here in that previous panel, we see her face, and it's, she looks very innocent and very young. And then as we go to the next one, she's like pitted up against three men who are outside the jail where her father is, and she looks much more mature, and it represents her aging as she goes through. You know, there's like a guy smoking a cigar and a man spitting tobacco. So she's pitted up against like much older people. And then here's Billy Glass, who's basically a fictitious version of Emmett Till, and um, he was also lynched for, for whistling at a white woman. And that's like, this, like whistling is kind of an innocent thing, and that just speaks to the danger that um, these people were forced to live with during that time, and how the ethnic trauma affected like everyone of every age. Um, this is a newspaper clipping that was in the, it's a panel, and this is dangerous because it speaks to like the stereotypical way that Lee's father is dr uh, drawn there, and if you look at any other panel in there, uh, Lee's father looks nothing like that. Uh, so. And then this is King by Anderson, and this is dangerous because it, it speaks to like the stereotypes that, ex that existed in the past and like to a certain extent still exist to this day. Um, you have some young black men just walking down the street and then they're apprehended by police officers for not doing anything. And uh, I know it's hard to see, but the conversation is very racist between the officers and they just automatically assume that they're associated with uh, criminal activities just because the way that they look. And then Anderson also plays with this theme of danger as he portrays Martin Luther King as a bit of like a ladies' man or a bit of a player in which many people don't know, or I guess King, Martin Luther King is not normally portrayed in that way. So here's uh, him talking to one of his friends about who, who he's calling and how he's always breaking hearts. <clears throat> And so uh, I, I kind of continued that theme of danger, and I looked at uh, the book Nat Turner, which is another graphic novel here. Um, let me kind of scroll down. Uh, okay. And so uh, we got a few panels here from Nat Turner, and you can already tell Nat Turner is a little bit of a different style than, uh, than the graphic novels that Dan was talking about. First of all, there's a lot less text involved, and uh, second of all, a good amount of the graphic novel is uh, in black and white. And, um, but we still get this feeling of danger here, and that's really important. And the first aspect I want to touch on is uh, the facial expressions that we see. In particular, this man here, uh, as, he, as he brings his child, presumably it's his child, and as we move down, he's carrying his child to throw uh, his child off the edge of the boat here. And so this is, just to give a little context, this is a slave ship, and they've just been brought over, um, they've just been brought over to America. And so it, this kind of shows the, the nature of the situation. Uh, and the fact that his face is almost eager uh, to throw his child over the edge is really interesting because that's not normally what you would expect from someone about, uh, about to murder their child. But uh, that really speaks to the situation because this is the sort of danger they're put in, and this is the outcome. I mean, he's trying to save his child from the life uh, that he knows he wouldn't want to have and, uh, and this is the result, and so it's really interesting that his face is portrayed in that way. Uh, also, uh, the panel layout, I think, is really important here, in that there's two panels on the first page, but if we go to the second page here, this is just one whole panel, um, and you can see as you go toward the bottom, it just becomes completely black, uh, and there's nothing else there. And so um, I thought this also spoke to the, the danger of the situation, highlighted this particular scene uh, where he's throwing his child overboard, just to kind of draw your attention right there. Uh, and again, that's important because it's highlighting your attention here, highlighting your attention to the dangerous outcome uh, of a situation where you bring slaves over into slavery and, and they really have no escape and this is what they're, this is a decision they're forced to make. And then one last thing I wanted to touch on here um, is the lack of text. And so you saw with Dan, with what Dan was saying, there was a lot of text there and that was really important in those, in, in those, uh, in those graphic novels, but here we don't have it. Um, and I also thought that was important because it brings your attention, it requires you to look just at the image. And as you can see here, the images are not particularly detailed, but there's a lot going on. And so by not having text there, it doesn't distract your attention from what is going on here. And so you can really focus 
um, your attention on what's happening, the child being thrown overboard, and if you go into the previous scenes, again, the, the facial expression of the man and your attention is focused there and not, on, um, and not on reading the text bubbles, which I also thought was important in bringing out this dangerous nature of the scene uh, and what these, what these uh, uh, African Americans are forced to go through. Um, and just finally to wrap up, so we talked about these, but I want to uh, touch on my view of danger and, and Dan's as well, and that we thought um, that danger in particular, all of what we've looked at here, we thought all of this was really dangerous, but we thought this, this differed from previous generations and that obviously at this time um, a lot of people did not find this dangerous, right? So we're bringing over slaves to America and obviously a lot of uh, slave owners at that time didn't find it dangerous. And so this is really interesting, this contrast between today and, and, and historical background. And so we try to think about why that was. Uh, and in particular, I think one of the things is that back then people didn't realize um, that stereotyping one, stereotyping one group and discriminating against one group can also branch into other aspects of society. So for instance, if, you, if you're going to discriminate against African Americans, you know, that could leak into discrimination against other groups, religious groups, uh, things like that. And I think that kind of went unnoticed. And so today we have a better idea uh, of looking into that and what it really takes to, to have social progress and things like that. And so we can look back at this now and say, wow, this really was dangerous, but uh, people at the time didn't really, didn't really see that. So that's pretty much it. We have a few minutes for uh, questions and answers, and before I give the uh, word to the audience, uh, we heard a few words uh, used a lot in, in all the panelists, and that was uh, used seemingly interchangeably, that was danger and risk. And I'm not 100% sure if those are exactly the same things. For example, when I go on an airplane, I know there's a certain risk about going onto that airplane, but I am willing to take that risk usually. But if I'm told that plane is dangerous, I don't know if I would, per se, go onto that plane. Uh, I mean, probably not. And so I was wondering, uh, you, you seem to use it all uh, somewhat interchangeably. So I wanted to know if you could maybe help clarify if you see those things are the same thing or, or are they on the same spectrum as sort of one sort of over there and risk leads to danger or, or how, how, what do you see the sort of differences? Because you talked about risk, managing risk, uh, I'm, but I don't hear often of talking about managing danger uh, as much. Oh, uh, I guess for me, um, risk is more, I mean, risk is more um, the potential exposure, the exposure to potential danger, and danger is like realized risk. Um, that's just how I've always thought about it. But. Yeah, I would, um, I would chime in and add that there's, as Professor Bernardson sort of alluded to, there's a certain risk in all of our daily activities. For instance, I'm going to leave the building and walk across Route 2, and there's a risk that I'm going to get struck down by a car. I can, I can certainly mitigate that risk in a lot of ways by looking both ways and staying in the crosswalk. But risk is some risk. I think the difference is that risk is something that's inherent in all of our actions, and we can take certain steps to, um, to mitigate it appropriately. Um, Danger, on the other hand, I think is something that's a little bit more threatening, a little bit more sort of outside of um, what we as individuals or we as society can really um, can really do anything about. Tornadoes, for instance, tornadoes are dangerous. They're not they're not risky. They're going to happen, or they're not. And that's sort of the way that I contextualize the difference between risk and danger. I think it's also um, personal, um, and I think that some of the things that I might consider dangerous, someone else might consider just to be one of those risks that you take. Um, you know, I'm thinking about jumping out of an airplane for me seems like something really, really dangerous, but there are other people for whom, you know, that's, that's risky and that's what makes it fun. And, and so I think, you know, making that, that leap from sort of risk to danger is, is can't necessarily be quantified. I think it's different, it's different for everyone and that, you know, we can consider lots of things risky, but not all of those things. We might not all consider all of those things dangerous. Um, I think that risk might also be a way of taking control of danger, and since risk is inherent in pretty much everything we do, and there's some, the chance of danger in everything we do, that when you talk about risk, you're a lot more able to control the danger and feel like you have a sense of um, understanding what the danger is and how much the danger is, and um, kind of you talk about mitigating the risk. Uh, you can't really mitigate danger. Yeah. 
I think, but you can mitigate risk. And uh, similar to that, uh, for me at least, and this is not 100% true, but I think danger is also often accompanied by fear. I think it usually kind of inspires a little bit of fear in someone, whereas risk, uh, like Allison was saying, is, is very calculable. So you can, uh, you, you are very aware of what risk you are taking and what risk you aren't. And you can make a judgment call based on that, where, where danger for me at least feels a little more like it's kind of a gut feeling. You just, you, know, you kind of feel like this is a dangerous situation or that, that is not a situation I would feel comfortable putting myself in. So I think for me that's, that's a pretty big difference. So uh, the panelists are willing to field questions uh, or if other people want to uh, contribute from the courses. We have Professor Bonta here. So I have a question for the panelists. I'm wondering if any of you through your course material so far have felt that you might have altered your view either of what you would like to do as a career or what you might do you know, this coming summer. Have, have any of your experiences through the courses made you less likely to take a risk or more likely to take a risk in your future endeavors? I mean, I, I kind of want to keep doing similar work and that was something that I arrived at during the semester and I don't know if it was, I mean, I'm sure it was related to this course um, and other courses I've, I've taken. Um, but I think for me, the idea of keep, to continue working on sort of how do we remember um, traumatic past and, 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 the, and the implications of, of the ways that we remember is something that this semester I realized I wanted to keep doing um, and was able to kind of take that leap. And yeah, it was probably related to the work I'm doing in this class. Uh, I think one thing I also learned from my class is that danger um, is, is kind of uh, placed upon you more than than you create your own danger. And I know that may differ for some of your courses. It's just what we've looked at. Most of the danger is, is placed upon certain groups of people. And so because of that, I don't think I'm necessarily less likely to take risks um, just because we haven't seen a, a whole lot of stuff where people put themselves in danger. It's more society and, and the danger it creates um, just due to the kind of the, the way it's organized and things like that, so. I don't think uh, the class has inspired me to go take a lot more risks or do dangerous things, but what it really has done is it, it's really made me aware that a lot of the things I do that I don't consider a risk and I don't consider dangerous that I do in my everyday life is not necessarily the same for everyone. That there were times, either historically or even today, that an action that I do every day and I don't even think about, someone might feel very afraid doing. It might be, very, it might be a dangerous situation for that person. Um, it's people brought up, you know, walking alone at night in Williamstown. It doesn't make me feel dangerous, but uh, I know we brought it up before, but during the Holocaust, if you were a Polish Jew, you couldn't walk alone at night outside. That was a very dangerous situation. And so I think it's made me aware, at least, that risks that I don't even consider other people are very aware of. And I think it's easy to take for granted that you're going to get your vaccines and you're going to be able to wash your hands. And um, I don't know if I'm washing my hands more often because of your class or not, but um, maybe not. But maybe I should be. <laughs> um, but I think that it's very easy to assume that you're going to be able to take these basic preventative hygiene um, kind of matters um, and that that's going to help protect you from disease. But it's also very easy to forget that those things are um, not available to everyone. Um, in our class, we've talked a lot about the relationship between film and, and graphic novel, and also we've talked about uh, how the graphic novel might be able to um, articulate trauma in a different way than you know normal written word. So I was curious about you know the, the film class on catastrophe in our class, and if there if you guys could talk about uh, how you identify with these stories, how film versus uh, the graphic novel format might help you identify in a different way, or they might show danger in a, day, a way that's kind of more accessible. Oh, yeah, definitely. The one that, one of the things that really comes to mind is um, when we watched Schindler's List and The Pianist um, right after each other, and both, for anyone who's ever seen these films, both of them depict the Holocaust in very different settings, and Schindler's List, fo or Schindler's List focuses on a large group of Jews during the Holocaust, whereas the pianist focuses on primarily one person. And seeing these two, the two vastly different struggles in the same historical context really was, I thought, eye-opening. Um, 
I think, too, um, in both graphic novels and movies, you're getting one person's interpretation. It's either the director or the author. You're seeing what they want you to see, uh, which is a trade-off because it means you're, you're losing other aspects. But it's also, um, I think you can connect in a different way because you're seeing um, something. It's a, it's a visual medium. It's not just, uh, you're not reading words on a page. You're seeing the way the characters respond to these horrors. And uh, I think, it, for me at least, it allowed me to access the material differently. And so you have to take everything with a grain of salt because you're, for every image you see, there's a hundred that you're not seeing from the same time period. But it's a, it's a way of connecting in a, in, with the material in a manner that we don't usually use. I think, can I also follow up on that? That I think whether it's a graphic novel or film or whether it's a work of academic history or even a trial, one of the things I've learned in this class is that you're always kind of seeing what that author or director um, wants you to see. And this week, one of the things we were exploring that I found really interesting was even in the case of a trial, the lessons that you take away are largely manipulated by, or not, I mean, manipulated sense, you know, but, but are determined by prosecutors who are trying to deliver a certain narrative by the courts. Um, and that, you know, with this history, whether it's a building or a museum exhibit or a film or a graphic novel, that the way that you're remembering something or seeing something is very much determined by a, a person in a specific place in a specific time. And I think that's important in all of our... But I think also with a, maybe a film or a graphic novel, it makes the danger like more real for the reader because I know that there was um, one panel in Nat Turner where there's literally just the barrel of the gun and you're just looking down it and it's, um, it's like in context with, uh, with slave traders coming over and, and taking African Americans. So it like puts you in that position and it makes you feel as though if you're actually experiencing that danger and I think maybe a way that text cannot always do. But, but would you, is there sort of, is there a consensus that sort of images, uh, film or images are more powerful in conveying that than say numbers that, or bacteria, <laughs> or whatever you're looking at, in, in, or words, uh, so is it, is that if we really want to depict the danger and these things, should we then, is it, or is it just your generation that responds more to graphic depictions? Or is, so I, is there consensus here, or do those who are more number-focused or text-focused, uh, do you share the same assumptions that they came from these Div 1 courses? Well, I think you said that um, you asked if images were more better at depicting danger, and we're not really depicting danger in our course. We're more, I guess, analyzing it or kind of... Um, so I think that images are probably very good for de depicting danger, like viscerally you get a reaction when you look at an image or you watch a clip of a movie. Um, but just the format of our course is not about depicting as much as analyzing. And so then you need your, your numbers <laughs> um, the way that we do it, at least. I think, too, often in real life, we experience danger visually. You can see something, and that makes you say, like, this is not safe. That's dangerous. And so I think when you have a graphic novel or a film, the director or author is doing the same thing. They're, they're making you feel. Like, that is, that is dangerous. This is dangerous. And I just think it's a way that we're used to experiencing danger. Because I think we very often see danger. Um, if you see someone skydiving, like the, it was brought up, that looks dangerous. If you had a list of skydiving deaths in 2012, I don't know that I would feel quite the same response as to that picture. So I think it's just a way that we're used to experiencing danger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also think, though, uh, images can be lacking, too, in some ways. And so they're not, like, the all-powerful way of communicating. Uh, and even in Nat Turner, I mean, the images I showed were just images, but as you move later on into the book, there's actually quotes from Nat Turner uh, that he's spoken about, uh, the situation and, and what goes on in when uh, a group of slaves murder uh, a group of slave owners. And he speaks about that. And so putting that dialogue with the images is actually extremely powerful. And so I think it's important to remember that maybe it's not just images or not just words, but maybe both together. Uh, can have a really profound effect as well, so. Yes, Professor Hirsch? To what extent in your courses have you focused on danger as having a positive value? Or maybe, put another way, the, the danger of being risk averse? Well, um, one 
One potential way of looking at that would be uh, when we've talked about the evolution of uh, resistant strains of, and so being risk averse, um, pumping too many antibiotics um, into too many patients, you're going to increase the chance that you're going to get resistant <coughs> strains more. And so that's a tricky concept because, you know, you have to treat what's there and um, I guess that's all I had for that, but that would be a potential danger to being risk averse. There's new risks that evolve. I would add that in a, in a financial context, there's always, let's use a basic example of a bank, bank making a loan, there's always that risk that the loan might not be paid back or some sort of unfavorable economic climate might happen where the creditor, the lender, might lose their, um, their principal on the loan. But undertaking that risk and understanding that risk that this loan will go out and it will create jobs and industry and improve the economy is, again, a sort of a manageable risk that um, just is to be understood and that's something we're sort of hoping to do to um, better make informed decisions about danger and risk. And I think in our tutorial, um, while it's very clear that writing these histories and, and creating memory is, is dangerous and it's risky and, and all those things, I think there's no sense that because there's danger involved, we shouldn't do it. And I think actually the message is, is exactly the opposite, that this is something that can be really scary and there are risks involved in all, in all of this stuff, but you know, memory is still very important and we just have to be, think carefully about the kinds of memories we're forming. And it's by no means saying don't form memory at all or don't remember, it's saying think about how how we're doing it because there are risks involved. And also looking back on dangerous situations can be important uh, in making decisions about future situations. And so kind of like when you guys talk about uh, economic crises and things like that, being able to look back on what went wrong and then maybe looking at commonalities and, and applying that when you make future decisions can actually have a, a positive effect for the future, uh, not making that same mistake again. So helps. The sense of fear, the sense of danger could also be like galvanizing in a way to give, make you take certain measures or actions to prevent something really, really bad from happening in the future. Any other concern or question or agreement or disagreement that you'd like to share with our panelists? with each other. Well, uh, our next panel uh, will be on November the 13th uh, here uh, at 7.30, I believe. Uh, we'll have five different kinds of courses that I'm representing, and it will be very interesting to see to what extent they approach, and they'll get exactly the same questions uh, that these uh, panelists, our excellent panelists, had for today. And then we can maybe sort of build on the conversation that we had tonight for that night as well to see uh, how people are approaching the subject matter. And I think this was a, a very nice panel just to see the, the diversity of approaches that is taking place every single day here on the Williams campus. We often don't see that in action and, and sort of people trying to talk beyond their discipline, beyond the subject matter in terms of coming to some sort of common conclusion. So I hope in, that, uh, in the future we'll be doing more of these kind of things and hopefully you learned a little bit about uh, uh, your own subject matter by learning from other people's subject matters. So let's join me in, in thanking the panelists once again.